Okay, so just before we went on the break, uh, we were looking at three ports networks. And now we made the conclusion that a three port network cannot be matched at all ports while it is still lossless and um, reciprocal. And then we said that if one of the conditions could be relaxed, i.e. the condition of uh, reciprocity, so that we have a realizable uh, three port network, which is matched, lossless but not reciprocal, then we come up with a device that is called a circulator. And this is the image of a circulator, an actual circulator. And the S parameters for the circulator we derive to be this. For the clockwise circulator, which means that from port one, uh, from port one, you can only have uh, output at port two and from port two you can only have output at port three from port three you can only have output at port one and similarly for the counterclockwise circulator now today we want to look at the case of a four port network what is the case of a four port network is it the case that also a four port network cannot be uh matched at all ports, reciprocal, and at the same time lossless? Well, that is not the case for a four-port network. A four-port network <clears throat> can be matched at all ports, and reciprocal, and lossless at the same time. And the S parameters of a four-port network is a four-by-four four matrix, as we have seen. If the network is matched at all ports, then all the diagonal elements here have to be zero. That is S11, S22, S33, S44. They all have to be zero. But because we said that the network is also reciprocal, then if you remember, SIJ is the same thing as SJI for a reciprocal network, SIJ must be equal to SJI. So that we have S12 here, but we also have S12 here. S13 here, we also have S13 here. S14, and we also have S14 here. And so the network is reciprocal. SIJ equals SJI. <clears throat> And because it is lossless, then the products of the conjugate transpose times the original S matrix should be equal to the unitary uh, matrix. And the original matrix, remember, we said was what? Reciprocal. So again, S12, S12, S13, S13, S14, S14, S23, S23 here, S24, S24, S34, S34. So when we do this multiplication, we should have this unit matrix because it is lossless. It's lossless. <clears throat> so now we can look at some manipulation of this product of matrices and see what results we can get. To start with, we look at the product of row one, column two. So row one, that's row one here. And then being multiplied by column two here. So it means we'll have S12, because S zero times S12 will be zero. S12 conjugates times zero will be zero. S13 conjugates times S23 conjugate is available. So we have S123 conjugate times S23, sorry. S13 conjugates times S23. And then we'll of course have plus S14 conjugates times S24. So S14 conjugate times S24. Now because we are not multiplying 
the same row by the same column, then this will be equal to zero. It will correspond to the next element here. So that will be equal to zero. It's only when we multiply the same row by the same column, then we have that being equal to a diagonal element, which is one. So this is equal to zero. Similarly, similarly, if we look at the product of row four, column three. So, sorry, we have row four here. And then we are multiplying that by column three. So for this case, we have S14 conjugate times S13 conjugate, which we have here. And then S24 conjugate times S23 conjugate, which S23, sorry, which we have here. And then S34 conjugate will be multiplied by zero. And then zero here will multiply by S34 conjugate. So we have these two equations. So for the case of row one, column two is this equation. And for case of uh, row four, column three is this equation. So this equation here, this equation here is uh, 7.01a. And this equation here is 7.01b. So now what we are going to do is to multiply 7.10a by S24 conjugate. So we multiply this equation by S24 conjugate and then multiply this equation by S13 conjugate. And then we subtract the two equations. When we subtract the two equations, we get this equation, which is 7.11. And it is very straightforward to see. Because if you multiply this by S24 conjugates, then what is common here, we have S24 conjugate, S24 conjugate here. And then you multiply this by S13 conjugates, and we have S13 conjugates here. So we have S13 conjugates here and S13 conjugates here. So both S13 and S24 are common, and then S14 conjugate can be uh, factored out of the uh, equation and then we have this case. Now what we have done here up to this point from 7.108 from 7.10 to 7.11 we can repeat the same thing for a different set of rows and columns. Again if we look at the case of multiplying row 1 by column 3. So it's row 1 here and we are multiplying that by column three. Here. So when we do that, we have zero times S13, which is zero. S12 conjugates. S12 conjugates times S23 conjugates. So we have S12 conjugate times S23, sorry. S12 conjugate times S23, we have that here. And then S13 conjugates times zero is zero, S14 conjugate times S34, and we have that here. Similarly, we do the same thing for row four, column two. For row four, column two, we have this one being row four, and then we have column two here. So for row four, column two, we have S14 conjugate, times S12, we have that here. We have S24 conjugate times zero, which is zero. S34 conjugate times S23, which is here. And then this is zero times S24, which is zero. And again, because we are not multiplying the same row by the same column, the result will be equal to zero. So we have zero here. Now what we did to this equation was to multiply A by S24 conjugate and B by S13 conjugate, and then we subtract the two. So similarly for this equation, we are going to multiply A by S12, and then B by S34. And when we subtract the results, we get this equation also. Now, if we look at the two equations, um,
that is this equation So you look at this equation and this equation, and it will be revealed that now in this equation here, we can say either S23 is equal to zero or both S12 and S34 are equal to zero. So if we say, if we say that S12 and S34 are both equal to zero, then it means over here to they are equal to zero. But we can say also that S23 equals zero and this equation is satisfied and S14 also equals zero and this equation is satisfied. So for the case when S14 and S23 are equal to zero, what it means is that whenever there's an input in port four, there is nothing coming out of port one because input in port four and output at port one is S14. So you have an input in port four, there is no output at port one. Similarly, if you have input in port three, there's no output in port two. Uh, but because the network is reciprocal, it also means that if the input is in port one, then there is no output at port four. If the input is at port two, there's no output at port three. It means that for the four port network that is reciprocal and is matched at all ports and it's lossless, then always port one and port four, as well as port two and port three, they are isolated. They are isolated. Now what it means is that if you have an input in port one, it can only exit at port two and port three. Similarly, if you have input at port four, it can only exit at port two and port three. Or if you have the input at port two, it can only exit at port one and port four. Or an input at port three can only exit at port one and port four. Nothing between port one and four and port two and three. It means that since you can have input from port one and back out at port four, nor can you have input at port two, which will emerge at port three, then a four port network that we have so described is only what? Directional. So that's a, a characteristic of a directional coupler. It couples the input from port one only to port two and port three. There is nothing coming out. It's only in one direction. So it is called a directional coupler. So with this condition already um, noted, i.e. there is no coupling between port one and port four. Between port one and port four is isolation. Between port two and port three is isolation. No coupling between port one and four, no coupling between port two and three, and therefore it operates as a directional coupler. Now, if we look at the case of the diagonal uh, elements, of the matrix or of the multiplication or the products, then we can have S12 squared plus S13 squared equals one. When is that the case? When you multiply row one by column one, it should be equal to one here. So row one here, S0 times zero, S12 times S12, that's S12 uh, squared then S13 times S13. Squared, excuse me. S12, S13. So row one here times column one. And that should give you 
S12 squared plus S13 squared equals 1. And similarly, for of the remaining diagonal elements, you have S12 squared plus S24 squared equal 1. S13 squared plus S34 squared equal 1. And then S24 squared plus S34 squared equal 1. If we examine these equations critically, now remember that uh, we had previously set S14 and S23 to be equal to 0. So S14 here is 0, S14 is 0. So we can only have, you can only have S12 and S13 here, and then S12 and S13 here. And that is what is also applicable to the other, uh, to the other element. So we have S12 and S13 and so on and so forth. Now we inspect these equations uh, critically We'll see that here you have s12 squared plus s13 squared equal 1. And then you have s12 squared here also, s24 squared here equal 1. It means that since you have s12 here and s12 here, then this element here, s13 squared or s13 here, must be equal to s24 squared. And that is the only way when you add this to s12, it should be equal to 1, as is in the case here. So s13 equals s12. Uh, s24. And then similarly, we are looking at um, there is a S13 here and S13 here. And then S34 and S12. So if this is equal to 1 and this is also equal to 1, then it means that this S34 must be equal to S12 because what is common here is S13 and S13. So the common factor here is S13 and S13 here. So it means then S34 must be equal to S12 for them to be equal to 1. So what we have come, the conclusion we have come to is that S13 equals S24. And then S12 is also equal to S34. So if you look at this uh, coupler or directional coupler, what is S13? So input is at port 3, it emerges at port 1. And that should be equal to S24. Input at port 2, emerging at port 4. Similarly, input at port 2, emerging at port 1. And that should be equal to the same thing as what? Input at port 4, imagine at port 3. So what it means is that the directional coupler will have, if you have an input in port 1, the same input will emerge at port 2 and emerge also at port 3. If you have, imp but nothing will come out of port 4. If you have input at port 2, it will emerge at port 1 with the same face, but a different face at port 4, which we'll come to demonstrate here. So for simplicity, since S12 is equal to S34, we equate all that to a certain number, alpha. And as we've seen here, so from port 1 to port 2 is in phase. But since this has to emerge at port 3, it may come out with a different phase. So we make S13 being equal to beta, a certain factor, with a certain phase theta, and then S24 also beta with a certain phase phi. Since S24 is the same thing as what S13, the magnitude are the same. So beta here and beta here, but the phase may be different. So we have theta and phi here. So if we go back to our original matrix, and then we multiply row two by column three, row two by column three. So this is row two, and this is column three. So let's highlight those ones. Row two, column three. But you will remember that we said S14 equals zero, and the same thing as what, S24, right? 
So um, let's let's verify that. So sorry, it's rather S two three and S one four. They are zero. So S two three here is zero, and then S S one four is zero. Okay. So if S two three is zero, this is zero, and this is also zero. Therefore, the only product will be S one two. So S two three is zero. So we have uh, S one two times S one three conjugates. S one two conjugate times S one three, and then also S two four times S three four. S two four conjugate times S three four. So that's what we have here. Now this must also be equal to zero since we are not multiplying the same row by the same column. In that case, we substitute alpha and beta. S12 is the same thing as S34 and it's equal to alpha. So please, you are mute your microphone only if you want to ask a question. So here we have the element S12 is alpha and S13 is beta, ej, theta. So we have alpha, beta, ej, theta. And then S24, S34, S24 conjugate, S34. Now because S24 is this, and then S34 is alpha, so we have alpha, beta, E minus J5. Why minus J5? Because we are dealing with what? We are dealing with S24 conjugate. S24 is B, E, J5. So the conjugate will be minus J5. And this should be equal to zero. If this is equal to zero, then um, since we have already said that these elements are not zero and they have magnitude alpha and beta, it means alpha and beta, which is common here, cannot be zero. What can be zero is ej theta plus ej minus phi. That can be zero. And how can this equation be satisfied? What values must theta and phi take such that the addition is equal to zero? Remember that ej theta is equal to cos theta plus j sine theta. So if this addition has to be zero. One possibility is that if theta is 90, then cos 90 is zero, and j sin 90 will be equal to what? This will be zero, and this will be equal to one. And then if phi here is also 90, then cos theta will be what? Again, zero, but sin theta will be equal to what? Minus one. Therefore, when you add them, one minus one, that should be equal to zero. So that's one way it can be satisfied. What about 180 degrees? When theta is 180 or pi, cos 180 is one, sin 180 is zero. And then cos minus 180 for this one will be minus one, and then sin 180 till zero. And that will also give you zero. So it means that one possibility for this equation to be satisfied is either when theta is equal to phi equals pi on two or theta equals zero, uh, sorry, phi equals pi. This is one option. That theta must be equal to zero and phi equals pi. If you put that in this equation, so when theta is zero, sine zero is zero, but cos zero is one. And then uh, phi is pi, which is 180 uh, cos, cos 180 um, plus j sine 180 must be equal to minus one then. And that will be equal to zero. So these are the two options for the equation to be satisfied. Now, if that is the case, then we can find all the elements of the coupler because we have said that 
First of all, all the diagonal elements are zero. Then it's also reciprocal. But in addition to that, S14 is equal to S23, which is equal to zero. So the only elements are the ones that exclude the diagonal element as well as S14 and S23. So the diagonal elements are zero. S14 is zero, and therefore S41 must also be equal to zero since it's reciprocal. S23 is also equal to zero. So S23 is zero, and therefore S32 must also be zero. So diagonal elements here zero, and here also diagonal elements here also zero. And the case of theta equals uh, zero and then phi equals pi, then we are going to have um, uh, quadrature elements here uh, because uh, j sine theta has a value, which is, uh, that will be jb, so you have j beta here and then j beta here. That's all from here. So s1, 3, and then s2, 4. For the case where theta equals 90 and 90 here, then all of this is equal to zero. And therefore, you have alpha and beta being the only surviving elements. And that's why you have all of this being just alpha and beta. But in the case when theta equals zero and then uh, phi equals 180, then we'll have minus j uh, in the, uh, among the elements, which is why you have the uh, component here with j, j beta here and j beta. So these are the elements of the matrix. And to construct this, for the case of the symmetric coupler, what it means is that um, you have an input in port one, if that input is alpha, then you're going to have it being distributed to port two and port three. And this is a simple way of constructing the uh, directional coupler for the case where it is symmetric. That is theta equals phi equals pi on two. So we have the z naught, z naught, z naught, z naught here, why? because all ports must be matched. And for all the ports to be matched, this has to be Z naught, Z naught, Z naught, and Z naught. And then the other arms are Z naught divided by root two and Z naught divided by root two. Now this can be derived from the analysis we call the even and odd mode analysis, but we're not going to go into those analysis. And this will be Z naught and Z naught also. And each one of these arm is lambda by four. So that in this case, because theta equals phi equals pi on two, then we have alpha squared plus beta squared equals one. And then for the case of the anti-symmetric coupler, it's not symmetric. So the design is such that between port two and port four is three lambda over four and then lambda by four between each of the other ports. Now, when constructed this way, the coupler will operate in the same way that we have described. The conclusion we have reached is that if it is a four port network and it is matched and it's reciprocal and it's lossless, it has to be a directional coupler. Why? Because S14 and S23 have to be zero, which means S41 and S32 uh, also have to be zero. That means port one and two will be isolated, sorry, port one and four will be isolated, and port three and two will be isolated. That is what makes it a directional coupler. So whereas we say in the case of a three-port network, it cannot be reciprocal, much and lossless at the same time. A four-port network can be reciprocal, lossless, and much at the same time, and it is still called uh, and it is going to be a directional coupler. There are some parameters of the directional coupler which are used to measure the performance of the directional coupler. But we look at again how it operates as I was trying to explain earlier. 
So port one is used as the input port. Port four is isolated, as I described earlier. Once you have an input at port one, there can be nothing, there can be nothing out of port four. And then whatever is input at port one will go through to port two. So we call port two the through port. And then some part of it will be coupled to port three. So port three is called the coupled port. So this is one symbol of the directional coupler and this is another symbol of the directional coupler. But the operation is the same input at port one, port four is isolated. And then the input at port one, the in-phase output will be, will go through to port two and then the out of phase will go through to the coupled ports. So S13 is a coupling factor. Why? Because the input at port one is coupled to port three and therefore S13 is called the coupled uh, factor. Remember S13, will be the same thing as S31. And S31 is what we just described. Input at port one, output at port three. And then the remaining power, S12 squared, which is alpha squared as we described earlier, must be equal to one minus beta squared because alpha squared plus beta squared equal one. So once beta is a coupling factor, the remaining will be what? one minus beta squared. So one minus beta squared is alpha squared. And that will go through the through port as we saw here, as we described here, through port. And ideally, no power is transmitted to port four. So port four is isolated or the isolated port. And these are the metrics for measuring the performance of the directional coupler. It's coupling, because the coupling is between port one and port three, the coupling C is 10 log P1 divided by P3. So the input power divided by the power out of port three, you take the logarithm of that, and then we have the coupling. But since P3 over P1 is beta, then P1 over P3 must be one over beta squared, one over beta in terms of power. So this is 10 log one over beta squared. And this is B, beta raised to the power minus two beta raised to the power minus two, and that minus two index can multiply 10, so you have minus 20 log beta in dB. There's a directivity which measures the amount of power that is input here and how much of it goes through the through ports. And that is between port one and port two, or port three and port four, it's the same thing. So the directivity is 10 log uh, P3 divided by P4. But since we are using port one as our input, we can also say that it's the same thing as 10 log P3 over P4 times P1 divided by P1 because P1 should cancel. But again, we know that P1, P1 divided by P3 or P3 divided by P1 is beta. As we saw here, P1 divided by P3 is one over beta squared. Therefore, P3 divided by P1 is beta squared. So we have 10 log beta squared and P1 over uh, P4 is the same thing as what? S14. Um, sorry, S41 or 1 divided by S14. So we have beta squared over S14 squared here. And that is the measure of the directivity. So the directivity, if we take this into account, uh, this beta over S14 all squared, and the square will multiply 10 here. So we have 20 log beta divided by S14. And finally, the isolation, which is between port one and port four, is 10 log P1 over P4, which is minus 20 log S14. Why? Because P1 over uh, P4 is one over S14 squared, which is the same thing as S14 to the power minus two. And so you have minus 20 log S14 squared. And because of the relationship between alpha and beta, this is also established. The isolation is equal to the directivity plus the coupling. So if we have a factor for the coupling, we can get the actual S parameters of the four-port directional coupler. So in the case where there's equal power splits, which means alpha is equal to beta, 
equals one over root two. Why one over root two? Because one over root two, if you square it, you get one over two, which is half of the power. So in the case where alpha equals beta and equals half, and the phase shift is 90 degrees, then there's a phase shift between port two and three is 90 degrees. When fed at port one, then we have what? A quadrature hybrid. And the quadrature hybrid, this is the S parameters of that. And because alpha equals beta equals one over root two, we can factor out one over root two, and then we have this. And that is the S parameters of the quadrature hybrid. But again, for a coupling factor of 3 dB, which means alpha equals beta equals 1 over root 2. So in this case, we have um, the case of what? A magic T or a rat race hybrid. I guess there was a mix up in the earlier uh, matrices. So this is actually for the symmetric coupler. And this is for the anti-symmetric coupler. Let me correct that. Because I think the J is the uh, is because of the 90 degrees. With 180 degrees, you're not going to have J. So this is rather for the 180 degrees and this is rather for the uh, 90 degrees. Because as I said earlier, if you have cos theta, cos 90 plus J, So 90, that's when you get the J uh, uh, beta, because uh, uh, what is it? Is um, we have said that S12, S34 is alpha, and then S13 and S24 is beta. So when you have EJ beta, EJ theta being 90 degrees and this also being 90 degrees, that's when you have the J in the equation because then this is J sine 90 degrees, 90 degrees is one. When it is one, it is all going to be zero. So this is the only case when you have J in the equation. And therefore this is for the quadrature hybrid. J here means an angle of 90 degrees because when the angle is 90 degrees, this is equal to J. And so for the quadrature hybrid, it means that <clears throat> It means that when you have an input at port one, there's a the same, there's a in-phase output at port two, but then port three will have a phase difference of what? 90 degrees. And that is the case that is demonstrated here when alpha equals beta equals one over root two. So one over root two, we factor that out and everything here is one. So this element here, for example, is S12, which is the same thing as S21. So when you have input at port one, the output at port two will be one over root two, or in power terms, half. But then the output at port three will be what? Uh, J over two, which is, is half, but it comes with a phase difference of what? 90 degrees. But for a coupling factor of three dB, that is alpha equals beta equals one over root two, and a phase shift of 180 degrees between port two and port three, that's five, Phi here equals uh, 180 degrees. <clears throat> then you have the, what we call the magic T or the rat race hybrid. So for the magic T, uh, the phase difference is what? 180 degrees, that's minus one. A phase difference of 180 is minus one, which is what you see here uh, as minus beta and the minus beta here, or minus one here and minus one here. Now this is the, uh, image of what we call the magic T. And so this will be port one, the input port two, port three, and port four. If you have an input at port one for the magic T, then you have uh, half of it 
through port two and then half of it to port three, but with a phase difference of 180 degrees. And there's nothing out of port four, which is the magic because you think that anything into this port must come out of port four, but no, it doesn't work like that. So whatever is input in port one here, it exits in port two and port three with a phase difference of 180 degrees and nothing out of port four, which is the isolated port. So that is a summary of the um, four port network. Now this is called the rat race junction. Why is it called the rat race junction? Because we have port one here. When there's an input in port one here, there's an output at port two. And you think that the next output is at port four, but no, it doesn't come out of port four. It comes out of what, port three. So port one, exit at port two, all the way to what, port three. And there's nothing out of port four, which is like strange. It's like a rat race. Uh, so the mouse never knows, uh, sorry, the uh, cat never knows where the mouse is going to exit. So we have already uh, discussed two port network, but there are some practical, sorry, three port network. But there are some practical three port network <coughs> that we'll look at. So the case of a lossless divider. If you say lossless divider, then you know that one of the conditions has to be relaxed. And the condition that is relaxed in this case is a condition of matching. Because it's three port, you cannot get all the three port matched at the same time for it to be lossless and reciprocal. So the condition that has been relaxed is a matching. So while port one is Z naught, port two has a different impedance and port three has also a different impedance. The matching condition should be then that the input impedance here should be equal to JB, and B is a stored energy at the junction due to this uh, discontinuity. So whatever you have at the input here, there's a discontinuity here, and therefore some energy will be stored. And that energy is denoted by JB. So it should be JB plus one over Z1 plus one over Z2. And that should be equal to Y in should be equal to one over Z naught. And this is how we, de uh, we determine the ratio of the power that goes into port one and the power that goes into port two. So for a T junction power divider, which has a Z naught equals 50 ohms, that's for port one. This example determines Z one and Z two, if the power has to be divided into the ratio one is to two. One is to two means that uh, one part of the power Yes, Christian. Christian, no, you can unmute your Yeah. Uh, please, we relax the matching. So when you say the matching condition, does it mean that when those conditions are met, we can still have matching or what? No, we are simply saying that with this one as it is, we know that for this to be matched, for this to be matched, then y in must be equal to this. It doesn't mean that we're going to match Z1 and Z2. Do you understand that? We are using this as a means of determining the power ratio, but they are not matched. In fact, in this example, by the end of the example, you actually see that the only matching is when you look at from port one. So if Z1, if one over Z1 plus one over Z2 plus J beta equals Y in, then it means when you look from port one, you think that the system is matched. But if you look from port okay. two, it's not much. From port three, it's not much. Okay. I hope you understand that. Okay. So yes, if please. you look at this, let's get there. We'll, we'll see that uh, the margin is only from port one. So to divide uh, into the ratio one is to two, here for simplicity, we are assuming B equals zero. So if B equals zero, then the input power is half V naught squared divided by Z naught, okay? And then for P1 also, it will be half V naught squared divided by Z1, which is the impedance of Z1. 
but we know that the power is divided in the ratio one is to two, which means that the part that goes into Z1 is one divided by the sum, which is one divided by three, one divided by three P in. And since P in is half V naught squared over Z naught, then the halves will cancel, V naught squared will cancel, and then you have one over Z1 must be equal to what? One over three Z naught. So in that case, Z1 must be equal to three Z naught, which is equal to what? 150 ohms. And then similarly, uh, for the case of Z2, P2 must be equal to what? Half V naught squared divided by Z2. But that should be equal to two over three P in. And again, P in is half V naught squared Z naught. If you substitute that with P in, the half cancels out, V naught squared cancels out, and then one over Z2 must be equal to two over three what? Times Z naught. Which means Z2 must be equal to three over two times Z naught, which is 75. Now, Z in, if you look from here, Z in, we calculated this to be what? 150 and this to be what? Uh, 75. So Z in, if this is zero, then it will be Z1 parallel Z2. So that will be 75 parallel 150. If you work it out, it comes to be 50, which is the same thing as Z naught. So from this spot, there is matching. However, looking from the 150 ohm line, which is this one, sorry, Z1, 150 ohm line, you see that Z in will be what? It will be 50 here parallel 75. That is 30, so not much. And then if you look from this Z2, it will be what? 150 parallel 50, again, not much. So the only matching is what? From port one, where we have Z naught. So it means that for a T divider, and this is a microstrip implementation of the T divider, if you want the power to be distributed in the ratio one is to two, it means Z1 has to be what? Uh, Z naught, this has to be Z naught, but this has to be what? 150 ohms, and this would be what? Uh, 30, uh, 75 ohms. Then the other case of a power divider is also the resistive power divider. In the resistive power divider here, what condition has been relaxed? Can you guess? Because the three conditions, lossless, reciprocal, and matched, which of those conditions may have been relaxed in this case? Lossless. Lossless. Why? Because you lossless. have this, yeah, you have this resistance, which would eventually lossless. Be, yeah, I get it. I get it. Yes. So it is. It is lossless. Oh come on. Okay. So the condition of uh, oh, I think it's even here. So all ports match at all ports reciprocal but lossy due to the resistance. Now this is often not used because eventually half of the power is lost as a result of the lossy nature of the divider. And the last one is the Wilkinson power divider. So the Wilkinson power divider is also lossy and but there is also the key uh, uh, distinction of the Wilkinson power divider is that there's isolation between port two and port three. These two ports are isolated. What means is that whatever power is coming from port two to port three is terminated here in these two Z nodes and doesn't get into port, port three. So there's isolation between port two and port three. S three two equals S two three equals zero. So the reflected power dissipated in two Z naught resistor and it's not delivered to the output port. So we just have from port one to port two and then to port three. And it's usually a three dB power divider. And to design this, this has to be Z naught and this is root two Z naught. Again, these parameters can be derived uh, through what we call the uh, even an odd mode analysis, which we are not doing now. And this has to be Z naught, Z naught. But the length here has to be lambda by four. And that is called the Wilkinson power divider. So these are the S parameters of the Wilkinson power divider. Uh, port one is matched, port two and three are also matched. 
but and then the division between port two and uh, from S from the input port, you have uh, to the output ports. So S one two equals S two, S two one equals minus G over root two, S one three equals S three one equals minus G over root two. But the two output ports are isolated. Uh, so S two three and then S three two they are equal to zero. So this is uh, a wrap up of the practical uh, power divider. And this is also the design of the, as we saw earlier, the design of the practical quadrature hybrid. Uh, and these are the S parameters as we discussed before. So all ports are matched. Input is at port one, equal division between ports two and port three with 90 degrees phase difference. So whatever is input here, the same, half of it will go to port two and half will go to port three but with the phase difference of 90 degrees and nothing comes out of what? Port four. And this is another kind of coupler called the uh, uh, couple line coupler. And again, the analysis of this is where the even and odd mode analysis, which we are not going to discuss, but simply these are the parameters of the coupler. The coupled arms are each equal to theta. It means they are the same. And then the ports are all match Z naught, Z naught, Z naught, and it's reciprocal. And the same thing for the 180 degree hybrid. We said this before, but it's just a repetition of that. So if you are not using the 180 degree hybrid as a power divider, if it's a power divider, input at port one divided between port two and port three with a phase difference of 180 degrees. But it can also be used as a power combiner. If you're using it as a power combiner, that means that if you have an input at port two and another input at port three, so two powers are inputted, the sum of the power will appear at port one and the difference of the power will appear at port four. Again, if you're using this as a power combiner, input at port, one, uh, port two and input at port three, the sum of the input will appear at port one and the difference of the input will appear at what? Port four. But as a power divider, input at port one, half of it to port two, and half to port three with a 180 degree phase shift. That is if it is equal power split. But when operating as a combiner with inputs at port two and three, then the sum appears at port one and the difference appears at port four. Again, this is a practical design of the rat race junction. We saw that earlier. And this is for the uh, Magic T, the waveguide version of it, uh, Magic T. So these are the parameters for the design uh, of the rat race junction. Okay, so I give about five minutes for a few more questions and then we can uh, close. Are there any questions? Okay, so if there are no questions, um, your assignment after this class is a design of these two uh, elements. So you design the power divider as well as the 90 degree hybrid coupler. And this one, I will schedule it on the V class. I hear it has uh, problems, but uh, you have two weeks from now to submit that. Next week, there will be a discussion with a TA uh, on the design of a low noise amplifier. So a just brief summary of the design of low noise amplifier. And the low noise amplifier will be the 10 project for which you would have one month uh, to submit that. When the V class is up, I'll put that uh, these two projects uh, on the V class. But in summary, for now, you are designing the Wilkerson power divider and the 90 degree uh, coupler, directional coupler. And for the 10 projects is the low noise amplifier. And next week, Clifford will schedule a class and discuss that uh, with you, the low noise uh, amplifier. Uh, and that will be the 10 projects.
And that will be the wrap up of this semester's uh, work. Again, uh, two or so minutes if there are any questions. <laughs>